Thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I don't often come to uh, Canberra. Uh, I've been in Australia. I'm sort of out in Australia three or four times every year, but Canberra isn't often on the agenda, so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to tell you um, a bit about who we are and what we're doing and how we work and some of the projects that we've been working on and hopefully that can serve some, for some inspiration here. Uh, and um, I'm not going to show you some many glorious examples of how Lightwell goes through city, but it's more about the totality of cities on how everything works in concert and works together. So, um, so it's more about city quality, but I'm also going to tell you just a little bit uh, I talk about the starting point and um, why are uh, these Danish people all the way down in Australia and why, how come that makes any sense at all. So uh, it started out with um, Jan Gill down here uh, being educated as an architect in the 1960s uh, as a good modernist uh, coming out doing some good concrete buildings uh, for people to live in and um, then he married a psychologist who asked why are you architects not interested in people? Um, and that kind of uh, twisted his mind in terms of hmm, how, um, what is the relationship between people and physical form? So how, how does the design of buildings influence cities and streetscapes? How can you create environments where we enjoy being? How can we create environments where we don't enjoy being? And how can we also take more care of uh, climate issues when we do buildings? Uh, so that we start to um, to create buildings that actually fit the setting they're in. Um, this led off to a long academic career at the, the architecture school in Copenhagen um, and also writing a number of books. Um, the latest one, Cities for People, and uh, the first one, Life Between Buildings. And all of these books have been translated into 25 languages, which I think talks about the whole um, that kind of need or that kind of compassionate understanding of the need for understanding how we actually work in a more informed way when, with these items. And also uh, for us, very interesting in terms of how the ideas have just been embraced um, and how there's this eagerness in terms of, of trying to do a little bit better. Um, yeah, so that has led to the office. We've been around for 15 years. We're based in Copenhagen. These are some of them. Uh, 40 passionate employees have just opened uh, in March in the US as well. Um, so another 12 in San Francisco and New York. Uh, we've, which uh, for me personally is a disappointment because I always thought we would do it in Australia first. We've done much more work here. But well, that wasn't how it was going to be. So we work all over the world. Uh, in many different settings. It's always at our level. It's always getting down uh, at the 173 um, centimeters and understanding what goes on at our level and how do we understand it. Um, and using the whole uh, methodology around uh, making people visible, uh, around collecting information about how people use cities, how, where people walk, how many, at what times of the day, so what is the rhythm or the pattern of the public life in cities. What are people doing when they don't walk? Um, how, how much time do people spend? What are the age groups? What is the age and gender split? Um, so trying to understand more around the people movements uh, and becoming just as informed as we are on traffic. Yeah, working cross-disciplinary, we've also got anthropologists, uh, modern culture, all kinds of other uh, different um, education backgrounds very optimistic about the future. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, 16 Gill kits in 2010, so uh, quite an optimistic crowd of people. Um, and the overarching goal for us is to, again, to improve quality of life for people in cities. That's what we are aspiring to and what we are trying to achieve through the projects that we're doing. Um, create good, yeah, nice environments where we enjoy spending time, where we can even be inspired to take our computers out and sit and work for a while and make, uh, yeah, create new friendships among people, create meeting places where uh, different age groups can come together and meet and, and create a sense of community. And then we're also curious why some places, this is Copenhagen Harbour, 
why do they end up like this and wh where did it go wrong and why does it feel uninviting and what can we do in the future to avoid uh, places like these um, another one yeah um, so um, yeah these housing developments that I think are global phenomena as well in terms of, of um, of just completely forgetting uh, the scale, the space, the spatial scale between buildings, but going straight from benches to buildings and there's nothing in between. Um, yeah, and then all the other attractive places where people actually uh, enjoy coming and that become destinations. And why is that so? Um, what, are, what is it that we're enjoying and what are the qualities that we enjoy in cities and how can we understand that and translate that into new developments as well. Yep, overpopular. These guys are watching Australia Open in Federation Square, so very popular place. And does it want to shift? Yes, it does. So it's all back to the walking animal. So understanding um, the physical constraints of the model. Uh, while cars are being improved all the time, new systems, higher speeds, different things, turbo, diesel, or whatever. This is the same uh, little creature that walks around very slowly, five kilometers per hour. Um, and, uh, and how we are very sensitive in terms of, we use all our senses in communication. Uh, we use uh, our senses when we walk through the city and we need a certain amount of, of stimulus um, to be able to enjoy places or to be able to be feel invited to uh, to walk to different spots. Um, the visual um, sense, uh, uh, the view is uh, the most important one, and especially at eye level, that's kind of where we take in the majority of all our impressions. So ground floors of buildings is kind of the crucial bit. It doesn't matter about the penthouse or the little thing at the top, but how your building meets the city is the really crucial part. Uh, and that whole interaction between ground level and the city is, is critically important in, in the centres or town centres of cities. So we're talking about five kilometre per hour architecture. Uh, what, what are those environments and what is needed in terms of detailing and, and elements that can help to invite us? And what are the 60 kilometre per hour architecture that uh, more talks about getting into your car and moving through and where you're not in the same way encouraged to walk through. Yep, then back to when Jan was uh, educated. So this is, we call this the Brasilia syndrome, um, where you plan the city from above. That has been quite, uh, yeah, been the principle for many, uh, for many decades in terms of fixing things. So the architect, uh, the architect as the ma master planner of doing b uh, beautiful forms putting them together in a wonderful composition and yep, yep, perfect, it's just right. Um, and uh, forgetting a little bit on how that influences uh, people scale or eye level. So when we sit up here and do big plans like that, do side plans like this, well, what is the experience down at eye level? We're still a slow moving little creature, so what is the experience that we're provided at eye level and how can we make sure that these link up and that we actually uh, have something interesting to look at. Then the whole notion around, yeah, again, pulling down some of the, the relic, uh, city centers and clunking out uh, newer stuff that maybe didn't really cut the cake for many people that got a little bit sick and tired of it. Um, and uh, the whole uh, notion around scale. Uh, this is Singapore waterfront, very popular. You probably know it even better than I do but a very popular stretch um, to visit in Singapore. Uh, so built 100 years ago, and lo and behold, what is in the background? Um, so for us, it's interesting to understand what happened in between here. Scale went up, but how about ground floors? Um, how can't we uh, create something that meets the city better? And we tend to ask, don't ask what the city can do for your building, but ask what your building can do for the city. So they're part of a bigger picture and not isolated objects. Then the whole uh, notion around density uh, and around how these different models uh, show the same density, but in different ways. So either you can do the, the tower, you can do the row houses, you can do the more compact city blocks, and it's the same density, the same amount of uh, residential uh, going on, 
but they're just very different uh, ways of arranging your density. And with them, there are also very different ways of meeting the straights and on activating them or not activating them um, and how to do that. And uh, we tend to say that uh, this is uh, sort of the lazy architect's response to density, um, where you need to pay more care to how you actually meet the city and how you create a, a good environment and a good microclimate um, at the ground. Yep, so some of the challenges, um, we tend to get a lot of uh, monofunctional and deserted areas. Um, this is from Copenhagen again, in the new development uh, outside the city centre. Um, although there are just as many people walking through here as one of the more popular places in the city centre, um, very, very few choose to spend time here. Um, it's quite windy, um, it doesn't feel very vibrant. As you can like can tell from the picture. So uh, again, it's about uh, figuring out what, how can we understand our preconditions better. Um, this is looking at um, how public life has developed uh, over the years. So this is 100 years ago and this is 2000. So 100 years ago, a number of necessary activities took place. We had to drag our goods along. We had to um, sell things in the streets. Uh, we had to walk to get to anywhere. Um, so a lot of necessary activities took place. These have gradually gone down. We, all of us, are, um, many of us, are in front of computers in our offices or locked up in meeting rooms. And uh, we only have to go out and when to pick up our groceries, pick up the kids, um, or go to work. Um, so the necessary activities are fewer than they used to be. And then the optional activities are really what makes uh, cities come alive. Uh, so people choosing to spend more time so it's not just about the number of people coming in, but it's also about time spent. So how much time do people actually spend? Um, and how, how uh, can we make places more inviting and of higher quality so that people would choose to spend time? Um, yeah. So this is worst case scenario, if urban quality is not provided, this, it just dies out and becomes deserted. Um, so we need to develop communities uh, that put people first and, uh, and provide qualities that people will enjoy and can help create livable cities. Um, this is one of the principles that we've been, uh, uh, been working at in terms of uh, looking at when developing new areas, what is uh, the public life that can be expected? How many people will live here, work here, go to school, um, pass through, come to shop? Um, and what, out of that, what can we expect in terms of the amount of people spending time in the places? So what is the public life that <coughs> could take place or happen? Then what are the public spaces that can create a framework around that or the amenities for it? And then what are the buildings that create the public spaces and what are the ground floors that activate them? So um, this tends to reverse the planning process where often when we uh, are invited to uh, different places, it's starting with the buildings, then some spaces are created in between, and perhaps something is going on in the streets, so or maybe not. Um, it's very hard to fix uh, afterwards if it went wrong. Uh, it's better, yeah, it works better to kind of think it in from the front. Now I'm going to show you a little bit uh, from my home region. Um, so we are up far north, even colder than here. You think it's cold now? No, it's not. <laughs> uh, so far north, Copenhagen is over here, Copenhagen city centre. Um, this is Sweden. Um, this is Malmo, same size as Canberra almost, 300,000. Um, there's a bridge in between, um, a recent bridge, and mm -hmm. this is a new development, or a 10-year-old development that happened in Malmo that I'll just talk briefly about in terms of um, of how that was created. Uh, the story around Malmö is that that's very much a city that went from a uh, city of industry to city of knowledge, uh, so that before people would come and locate in the city to work in the different uh, workplaces, where now a general tendency in many cities is that people go where they find a livable city, where they find a nice city where they can see themselves and their families uh, thrive and then businesses and workplaces will have to come to these cities. So that's kind of a major shift uh, where we used to have the steel factories. I, I spent time in Wollongong last week where 
Then you had the heavy industry that would cater for workplaces. Now it's the other way around. And how can cities focus more on livability in terms of making them attractive? Yeah, again, so 15 years ago in Malmö, 75% uh, of all workplaces were located, located outside the city centre. Uh, and 15 years later, 75% are moving inside. Uh, so big change in this city. This is uh, the harbour area, uh, a lot of industrial land in the city centre. Um, and, uh, and looking at how would that be developed over time. So it's quite a massive amount of, of uh, development that will go into this area. And the one that I'm um, focusing on is this, one, this bit up here, which was one of the first ones. So that's the prognosis for the entire area. Uh, so 20,000 more inhabitants. 10,000 students and 17,000 workplaces, so quite a lot to uh, fit in. Yeah, this is talking something about proximity, how easy it is to get there um, and what are destinations around it. Uh, and this is looking more at the development and 24 hectares of land, 1,200 apartments, 1,700 inhabitants and looking at creating a mixed-use development. Um, <coughs> yeah. So parts of this is that we are up in the cold part of the world with a lot of wind as well. And, uh, and what they were looking at is how can we take the, the typical grid and just twi twist it so that we create, um, so that we actually break up the wind uh, coming from the west here. Just break up the wind so it's not so easy for it to filter through the entire development. And also um, how can we through that also create more interesting walking routes and more interesting places to stay or spend time in, uh, in that area. So this is uh, the plan that uh, came up in terms of uh, developing these courtyard buildings, but twisting and turning them a little bit. There's the central park at the back, this is the waterfront. Um, yeah, fine brain networks, so many alternative routes, very easy to, uh, to move around in. This is the waterfront promenade. This is some of the, the scale of the housing. It's actually quite um, high density in this area. Um, but the interesting bit is perhaps that, that uh, looking at this, it's both mixed use, but it's also very mixed in terms of how it was developed. So there are a number of developers in there, there are a number of different architects. Um, and the whole idea was that you shouldn't develop it block by block, but that you should kind of mix it uh, mixed the architecture so that it was constantly um, challenging, um, challenging or being attractive to walk through. So giving new experiences and also offering different types of residential that would uh, that would attract different types of people. Yeah. So both being able to live in your little one family house, but also having higher residential development. Yep. Small courtyards, uh, green areas, um, looking at creating places where you could actually spend time, where you could be with your family or where you could meet friends, and how that related back to the more public areas uh, in the city. Uh, flexible ground floor use, so that was looking at saying, well, this development is changing over time, and there needs to be some flexibility in how ground floors are equipped so we can change them over time and adapt to, to, uh, to how the area is changing. <coughs> yeah. So in many of the little ground floors, you find the corner shop, um, the cafe, or some shared facilities, shared washing, shared whatever. Um, and, uh, and this whole uh, mix uh, was both at, uh, along the frontages, so along street level, but also uh, vertically in the building. Yeah. Overlap functions, so it's also lively at night. There's something going on at night, there's light. Um, also people overlooking the public spaces, so people are actually living there and looking after it and reporting if something goes wrong. Uh, quite focused on sustainability measures as well in terms of providing for an area that has uh, low energy consumption and, and a number of these other things. Yep, stormwater, it's all good. Very interesting area to visit if you ever get to Malmo or you pop by our office in Copenhagen, we're more than happy to take you there. So popping over the water and talking a little bit about Copenhagen, uh, my home city, um, that has gone to gone uh, long, and I'm probably doing this really speedily, but uh, gone from being a traffic place to more of a people place. 
and uh, with the overall notion of, of uh, trying to invite people to walk and bicycle as much as possible. Um, and that it shouldn't be forcing people, but it's just an integrated part of moving. So this is how it looked in the 60s and 70s. All the squares were parking lots. Um, and then in 62, uh, the pedestrian street was first created. Um, and that developed into a network of streets and squares, and even further into a network of both pedestrianized but also shared space. Um, and creating a, a network that actually activates a larger part of the city centre and that creates, uh, yeah, that, that uh, takes advantage of the spill-off effect from the main pedestrian street to also invite people to use other paths and also uh, have other uses uh, in the city centre. Yeah, so that's the pedestrian street, before and after. Um, some of the squares again before and after by taking parking out and doing it very gradually. It was never a massive movement in terms of, of freeing up space in the city centre and as part of doing it very slowly and over many years, uh, the city was also able to step up on uh, public transport uh, in terms of servicing it. Um, this is our waterfront, uh, so Nyhavn, a small canal coming in that again used to be for parking and now is um, a restaurant strip, very popular. Um, throughout the day. This is Town Hall Square. It used to be a nightmare to cycle through here. Um, and that has again also been simplified. Uh, the bus station has moved out and now this entire area is dug up uh, for, for a new metro coming in. So the city is constantly transforming um, and what has happened is that uh, people spend more and more time in the city. Um, so the more the more public space uh, um, a space laid out for people to use, the more people actually started spending time there and spending longer time there. So there's been a big positive response from citizens in terms of actively enjoying it and uh, making use of it, and they're staying longer and longer. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and this, yeah, again, is a, now a parking place for people all along. And constantly looks like this throughout summer. And also we see now that maybe the most positive development has been that one third of the outdoor activities in the evening and, and during um, the early night. So that's a really positive development. But it's in Copenhagen, it's taken 40 years. So a very long time uh, to, to uh, make the changes. And also Copenhagen started early and was maybe a pioneer in some of it. Um, but what's interesting is that it's continuously been documented. Um, so um, Jan sat at the university and um, developed a methodology for how to count people, how to map out what's going on in the city centre, uh, so that the city would constantly know how it was doing and constantly be able to measure new improvements in the city centre, new public spaces, and know whether they have pos been positively received or whether uh, it was a failure. So it, it makes the city more informed. Uh, it's not about guessing what's going on, it's actually about knowing. Uh, this is a new public life policy. Uh, the world's finest city for people, yeah. Metropolis for people, was adopted and put out, uh, setting measures on how to um, increase the level of activity in the city. But maybe more interestingly, what has happened also in Copenhagen is that uh, in order to deliver uh, these projects and in order to move forward, the city has had to move from a situation where the city government was more set up in, in different areas. So some taking care of the buildings, some looking after the trees, some looking after transport, uh, forgetting a little bit about the people, uh, into a more holistic thinking around how do all the elements come together and how can they benefit each other and how can we make the whole thing um, appear as a whole thing and a thoughtful uh, approach. So, um, yeah, also delivering uh, projects that set in a synergy of a wider precinct or a wider area and weren't thought of as isolated bits, but part of a, a long-term strategy. So what's happening now is that public life is growing in the city centre, so from the city centre and also to uh, the town centres around, so uh, people coming to the city centre and thinking why do I have to travel all the way in there to get a cup of coffee, maybe I could also get that where I live. Um, and then that is 
now growing. Also, the harbour is clean enough so we can actually jump in and get a swim uh, before we couldn't. Um, and this is probably the only place in the city where you're happy to walk around in your underwear in the middle of the city. So very interesting change um, there. Also the events have increased, so the city being used uh, all the time for more events, but also for bigger parts of the year, not just during summer. So we started to um, understand that, well, winter is not going to leave us. So wh how can we make the most of that season as well? Um, yeah. Christmas markets, a little bit about bicycling and just about how that's a citywide network. <coughs> it's for everyone, it's for kids, elderly, families, uh, young guys, not in Lycra, but something similar. Um, so here just talks about that there's a citywide uh, uh, network of uh, lanes provided, cycle lanes provided for people and that the mobile split has, uh, has gone up, so we got 37% using bicycle. This is even going further up now. 27% driving cars to the city centre, 33% using public trans transit, and 5% walking. So that is people travelling to and from the city centre. Uh, and again, this has been a gradual change uh, for many years in trying to get to this point. Also, uh, cycling hasn't always been popular. In Copenhagen, there was a point where it was decreasing, uh, but then oil crisis hit us in '73, and it was kind of rethought. Maybe we should encourage more people uh, to bicycle. Yep. So going up, uh, developing incentives for people uh, to go. So if you keep at a, a certain pace, you'll get a green wave. You don't have to hold back at lights, but you just get a green wave through. So that's kind of bicycling 2.0. Um, also, interestingly enough, 70% continue to bicycle in winter. Yeah. And why on earth do they do that? Uh, yeah, that's a big question. But if you ask people uh, why they bicycle, it's also interesting if you ask them whether it's because of the environment. Yeah, nah, yeah maybe. Health? Yeah. Uh, price? Because it's cheaper? Yeah. Convenience? Yep. It's convenient, it's reliable, you know exactly when you're going to arrive, um, and the system is also laid out for you, so it's easy to move around. So quite uh, an enormous, uh, a big part of the bicyclists actually continue, although the conditions are challenging. Um, yeah, so uh, now there's a new bicycle strategy, the first one, which is interesting again, that we haven't done much in terms of actually looking at the end goal. It's been incremental. So little steps, but all in the same direction. But now there's a cycling strategy, and the major complaint uh, is congestion on the bicycle lanes. Yeah, hard to believe. But that's, uh, yeah, so serious congestion, and that has had to be um, uh, helped off in widening bicycle lanes, uh, and also making compromises out here. It's not like everyone loves this, and it's great and stuff. There are also people who are a little bit reluctant um, to make the compromises uh, and to um, and to actually yeah com come to terms with that the city needs to hit a certain balance and that uh, there's a limited amount to what the traffic that can be invited to go through integrated with public transport a very important part you can go from the suburbs into the city center this is uh, the crown prince Frederick, uh, this is an Aussie kit, half Aussie kit, uh, bicycling as well. Um, so very kind of positive uh, tones around that. Maybe more, even more interesting is that economics. So city of Copenhagen has been um, calculating what are the economic benefits of bicycling. And uh, here it says that the economic advantages of shifting transport from car to bicycling is 60 cents per kilometer. So the infrastructure is cheaper but also um, you live longer, you just have to pedal 30 minutes a day. Uh, you live longer, you pay more taxes, um, you have a more healthy lifestyle, um, you don't go to hospitals as often, you don't have to be fixed in various ways. Um, so, yeah, this comes here, 30% lower mortality uh, on adults who stop bicycle regularly. And this is kind of a staggering number of saying this is the total health effect on all the kilometers cycled in Copenhagen. Uh, 335 
a million Australian dollars per year. So this is what the city is earning. So it's not about investing in bicycling infrastructure, it's about, it's actually a business almost, uh, where the city is really cutting down on health costs, getting more taxes, um, and also creating a more livable city. Yep, this is probably the last one I'm doing, maybe. Uh, we'll see how we go. Uh, so this is uh, jumping around the globe, down more down towards uh, your part of the world. So this is looking at Melbourne. And I think some of you might know this, and some might not know it, but Melbourne did some years back a study looking at transforming, um, transforming the Australian cities. And that was looking at, uh, at Melbourne in particular and thinking about how to fit in uh, the future growth in Melbourne uh, of one million inhabitants and how that could be done by not uh, focusing at um, the fringes, but thinking differently. So what Melbourne was looking at is with, with all the sprawl around Melbourne and with newer developments coming up even further out, this was actually building in new poverty zones. So with um, uh, oil prices coming up and petrol price rising eventually, um, this will be a very expensive house um, in 30 years' time. So how could, how could Melbourne grow in a different way that didn't include growing at the fringes, but more looked at growing more at the centre, utilising uh, the land. Yep. So this is city centre of Melbourne, and then looking at what are the corridors, where are we, uh, what, are, what is already serviced by the tram system and the public transport. Um, the fringes are not, and public transport will possibly never get out there. Uh, but we've got a number of, uh, we've already made a big investment in public transport, so how can we utilise that better? And this is looking at then what is the growth that could occur along the corridors uh, to utilise the public transport network that's already in state and utilise the land that's already uh, available. So, yeah, building in more and more street pattern. And then just looking at how can we include the growth along the corridor corridors and still keep some of the characteristics from Melbourne of the low scale, of the single family houses and what you have. So not changing the character of the city incredibly much, but, but looking more at uh, the corridors like this. Um, and how, how could uh, future growth, what would that look like? Uh, whoop, what happened? So uh, yeah, so looking at future growth and, and how could that be uh, introduced and actually provide, yeah, so underpin public transport, but also provide a more active edge along the corridors where a number of people um, are walking and bicycling anyway today. This is another example, one of the corridors, and again, what could happen Nicholson Street? what could happen along the corridor if growth was concentrated along the corridor and again utilising uh, the infrastructure. Another one. So, interesting. Uh, and the big uh, positive message was that you could easily incorporate the extra million Melbournians inside uh, the vicinity of the city centre. So you didn't have to go out and get new greenfield developments, but you could actually uh, get it integrated within the city fabric. Yep. Also looking at densities again and how, uh, how to increase density but to do it in a way that also feels like Melbourne, that doesn't feel like anywhere else and how, uh, how that can be achieved at different levels that doesn't necessarily include uh, high rise. A little trip to Wollongong, should we include that? And then a wrap up, is that okay? Yeah. This is just uh, last week. Um, so Wollongong is 300,000 people south of Sydney. You know it even better than I do, probably. But we've been doing some work with City of Wollongong looking at uh, the city centre and looking at uh, the public spaces and public life in Wollongong and studying how, can, how to revitalise the city centre and what, uh, how to increase the quality of the public spaces and also how to... Um, how to start documenting what's going on and how the city is performing to be able to come back and measure how the city is changing over time. Um, so <coughs> again, uh, coming from the north from a very flat little country, uh, this is an extraordinary setting where you've got the escarpment at the back uh, and you've got the foreshore here. And it's 
this is not any ocean, it's the Pacific. <laughs> For us, we, yeah, we've got this little inlet up at our place, but this is the Pacific. Uh, it's a wow, wonderful setting. Uh, even a little bit of topography in the city center is quite beautiful. The city center is quite walkable. We got uh, a kilometer from uh, the mall down to the foreshore, so it's quite walkable uh, to get around in the city center. Then we started looking at documenting how many people are walking and where they're walking, and it was quite evident that they, it was very concentrated around the mall. Uh, yeah, it's a favorite. I've seen your mall here as well, and it's the favorite Australian thing of sucking up all the retail in the little spot, and the same in Wollongong of having the mall here, uh, the shopping center, and then uh, the open mall here with the majority of pedestrians there, and you don't have to get very far away from that before it kind of rapidly drops also towards the foreshore. So not a lot of uh, activity outside um, the mall, and also what we looked at was what is the pedestrian patterns during the day, how does it increase during weekday and around lunchtime, and how what happens at night, and yeah, and the conclusion was not much, so the city closes down with the shops, and then people go home. But there's a lot of potential in terms of a number of people uh, working there, and 34 thousand students, um, sort of close by, but not in the city centre. Then looking at uh, the main street that leads, Crown Street, that leads from one end to the other, to the foreshore, uh, and to the railway station, and, uh, and City of Wollongong have been uh, doing a facade rejuvenation program along it that's been quite successful in, in providing some funds for businesses to improve along, um, along that stretch. Uh, and are also looking at uh, how to uh, how to upgrade this part of it. Uh, looking at the mall, it's quite a large mall. It's two times Pitt Street Mall in Sydney, um, so quite long um, and quite wide. Um, and uh, and it takes a lot for a city of that size to uh, populate it. What we found was almost eleven thousand people walk past here on a typical weekday. Uh, more than the population of Fig Tree, a little suburb just outside. Um, but uh, what we also found was that it was it f did feel very empty, and that uh, the programs around markets on Friday were really important in terms of activating it, in terms of uh, making it feel more lively and uh, more populated. Yep. Um, the Blue Mile, the foreshore, the most popular place for recreational activities, that's where most people go to spend time. Um, and uh, it's only 10 minutes away from the mall, uh, but still very, very few people actually walk down there from the mall. So very few people uh, were counted actually using the whole length of Crown Street, and there was this tendency to get into your car and just drive very short distances to get to where you wanted to get to, because it was so easy. Um, this is hard to see, but this is the city centre, uh, the definition of the city centre of Wollongong. And it's actually, again, uh, twice the si no, same size as, uh, as Sydney. No, twice the size. I can't read the numbers. I, yeah, so twice the size of the Sydney CBD. So again, a massively big area um, to actually call a city centre and to um, define in terms of where uh, future developments should go. So. In Wollongong, very much residents are at the periphery and also new developments that are coming up are at the periphery of the core of the city. And uh, only 650 people actually live in the core of the city area, which is also part of why I feel it's quite deserted at night. So, um, so, what we, um, so part of the project has been to discuss, is there a need of, of defining an incentive zone or a future innovation zone or something like that that can help to focus investments and growth into the central city area uh, and avoid again that all developments go to the fringes or, or even further out uh, where it's much easier or cheaper to develop. Again looking at density, same, same stories as before, um, similar densities but very different uh, build outcomes. Um, looking at what would what what's the right uh, scale for Wollongong in terms of are we after iconic buildings, uh, tall buildings, or after after an iconic place that still celebrates the escarpment, and how do we uh, how do we deal with the wind that comes in from uh, from the water, uh, and 
Yeah. So what we know is that, that high buildings tend to catch the, the, the fast winds and create a downdraft. So very windy places are created at the, at the street scale. Uh, whereas if we put it more compact and closer together, the wind tends to sweep over it. Again, shade, that has been mentioned also uh, during today from some of the trips that we've done here in the city, that here it's also really important with uh, getting solar access to the public spaces and how to create the best conditions for that. Quality of ground floor frontages, Actually, again, how does the buildings meet the city? And we uh, evaluated uh, frontages in terms of how, how active they were and how inactive they were. And what we came up with was that 60% of all frontages in the city centre were inactive. Um, so not much going on. And looking at the active ones, that was only 17% of all frontages. And then there was a lot kind of in between. Uh, so quite a, an important um, job to be done in terms of the facade rejuvenation and in terms of looking at um, how to activate the city. All of this was put together. Uh, in a number of posters that were on public display. So all the information that was gathered was put together. And uh, some of the information was, uh, was put into these small signs, street signs that were put up in the city in different places, uh, talking about what's actually here. Uh, so what are some of the potentials that we could build on? And everything is, uh, is now displayed at, at this uh, website of City Wollongong where people are, are also invited to engage and, um, and uh, yeah, give their opinion about it. And uh, the next phases will then be to talk about what can we then do about it? What are some of the projects that could um, try to tie the nuts and, and uh, create some of the connections that are missing today? Yep. I think I will probably end here. I've got something more, lots more stuff, but I think I might take too much time out of the panel discussion, so I think I'll just end it here by saying thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure to be here. I've been to Dixon, Gungalen, City Centre, so I've seen a little bits and pieces for Canberra. It's been a pleasure, and the weather has been wonderful. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you.